Okay. Well, welcome to this decision session of the Executive Member for Children, Young People and Education. Um, I'm going to ask if the Executive Member has any uh, interest to declare. And the response to that is I have no interest, neither personal, prejudicial, nor disclosable pecuniary interest. I don't intend to consider annexes A and B uh, to agenda item 5. Um, so, um, should that be necessary, however, I propose to exclude the press and public uh, if that matter does come into discussion. I'm going to sign now the minutes of the last um, decision session of the Executive Member um, from the 19th of March. Decisions made by the predecessor the Council of Lions. that is within that budget 
but goes on to say, I think it's in point 19, if I remember correctly, goes on to say that the details of the cost pressures within that budget will only come back at the end of the year. So I question how we can use a fund, a budget, when we don't know what cost pressures are in that budget yet. So I've got a number of answers, Jay, I'll wrap up quickly, I don't know, I'm probably well over three minutes. Yeah. The first is that the public have the right to know how this project has changed, and I'll ask you to bring that into the public domain. The additional budget, if approved, and I think it should be approved, because the project needs to go ahead, should uh, the recommendation not be delegated to officers, it should be delegated to officers in consultation with yourself to keep it tight to control. That's not what the papers say, but I think there's been cost overruns here and it's appropriate that members have some kind of scrutiny on that. And that there is more openness and transparency on the overrunning costs so the public can have some scrutiny in it. And we can ensure that we are indeed supplying the service to the most vulnerable young people that the project initially is going to do. I apologise for the way I that. Thank you for your uh, talks. Um, you took the words out of my mouth in some of the comments and questions that you asked, and so I'm going to um, pursue those um, by asking some questions. And um, I think the first question for the officers is can we have an overview of what's been considered in the body of engineering work done in arriving at the contract price and the plans for this project and stuff? Yeah. Um, so, we involved a commission the contractor to work with the design team via an early contractor involvement procurement group to work with us to look at buildability issues and cost efficiencies through a value engineering process. Um, all the value engineering decisions were taken in consultation with the design team. We the design team who is made up of frontline staff, parent, parent carers and different representatives from within the business. So, all the value engineering uh, decisions were made in consultation with that group. The value engineering decisions were then taken to the project board, chaired by Amanda, and they were signed off at that point. And I, uh, I think that the, the board was reassured that none of those decisions compromised any of the outcomes for children and people and the families that will benefit from the provision. All the value engineering decisions that were made were deemed a non-material elements to the planning process, so they weren't uh, deemed needing any changes to the planning. I think what would be helpful if, if I actually could talk through some of those decisions and it will give you a sense uh, of, of what we've done and what it achieved and what the impact is. Uh, before I go into that, I think it's worth noting that I found the value engineering, I know value engineering has a, has, has a negative connotation in you know, the forms, but I thought it was a very important part of the process. What we've done is worked in a co-productive way with parent carers, frontline staff alongside architects what I think that gave us was quite an aspirational design. By being a contractor on board to look at buildability and cost efficiencies, it gave a challenge to some of the aspirational uh, design elements, which were expensive and unnecessarily expensive, and in part, unnecessarily complex. Uh, and I'll talk through some examples and hopefully that will come out. I think it's important to say as well that some of the aspects of the design could potentially have had a negative impact on some of the children that we're using. So, for example, there were some fence arrangements and some um, trees that were designed in the original specification that, given the cohort of young people that are going to be using this, could have been climbing risks. So, some of those have been engineered out. Um, it saves money, but more importantly, it actually makes for a safer, a safer provision. I'll talk to the key areas, uh, and these are the, the key areas and the, I guess the largest areas where, where cost can be reduced. So there was a simplification of the roof design. So the roof had many different aspects to it, and what we did was just simplify that. By simplifying it, uh, we reduced the uh, meter squared, and it just made it much more efficient because it was just simpler. Um, we reduced the footprint, we reduced the area. Now we reduced the area in no way that compromised in any of this space for children and people. We reduced the area by taking out unnecessary circulation and corridor space. So there were areas where we had a corridor, or we had an area where there were two corridors next to each other with a wall down the middle, and we just reduced that into one corridor, which was a much better use of space. 
We simplified the interior and the exterior walls. There was examples uh, within the design where there was curves and indents in, in, inside and out, which made the design complex and it also made the buildability expensive. So we reduced that, so just by flattening some of the walls, reduced some of the cost. We also looked at a graduated specification across the building. This was always an aspiration, an aspiration within the building. So what we were looking to have is specification in the building, absolutely where, it, where it's needed, but not where it's not. The example being part of the building was, uh, is there for children with really complex needs with mental health issues and challenges. So that area needs to be anti liberty and built to a certain specification. What the architect had done is stretch that specification to other areas where it wasn't needed. Uh, I'll give you another example of that graduated specification. So um, uh, what we've done is put reinforced doors and double swing doors across the whole building. Double swing doors prevent uh, an anti-barricade, so it's where children could barricade themselves into a room or if they had a, a fit and they fell against the door, it wouldn't have been able to start to get in. Now they're needed, but they're not needed in every door. Some of the rooms have two entries to them. And what the architect does is put it throughout. So just by going through and just checking and challenging that, saying, do we need that specification everywhere? Again, reduce cost. Um, and again, Amanda's point, uh, really good point, in terms of we simplified, simplified the outdoor space that reduced cost, but the driver wasn't cost, the driver was risk to children. So there was a number of things in the garden. Trees by a fence, kids climb up trees, gets over the fence, uh, benches, which Yes, we all want benches, but actually what frontline staff said, actually having a bench there is not helpful because they climb on the bench and maybe climb on the building or it'd be used for things that we didn't want them to use uh, that for. So those are some of the areas that reduce cost but also simplify the design. What the simplification of design did as well was enable us to get greater cost competitiveness in our subcontractor quotes because what our contractor was saying in certain areas or work packages, we didn't have the level, the number of quotes that we would want to give us that competitiveness. That was in part because areas of design were so complicated, some contractors were looking at it and going, no, it's, it, it's too complicated. By simplifying it, we just opened up the market, we got greater competitiveness with quotes, so therefore reduced the cost. It's, it's quite a long winded yeah. answer, but hopefully it kind of breaks down some of the value engineering areas and just gives you some examples of what that means. In Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to concentration, but just talking about the additional contingency budget, how might it, what, what might it need, be needed for, and how does the grant funding timetable figure in the need for additional con contingency? Is that, a, is that an issue? Here? The grant funding isn't an issue, um, in so much as we've secured the grant funding, uh, and that's in place. The, the contingency is the original advice that, that we were given was that um, an appropriate contingency on a bill of this, of this nature was a 3% contingency. Um, having then gone through all of the work we've gone through in terms of looking at the, the level of detail in this build and the level of complexity of this build, because it is going to be a state-of-the-art provision, so it is, a, it is a complex build. The subsequent advice from our contractors has been that actually we need a larger, higher level of contingency, yeah. and that's what we've come to today, so that we have got an industry-recognised level of contingency in, in the budget. Given the work that, that William has detailed, in terms of the line by line going through the budget and going through the specification. I am very hopeful that we're not going to need to use this level of contingency. But given that that was revised advice from, from the experts that we've got in this area, it felt prudent to, to come forward with a, an industry recognised level of contingency. Okay. Do you want me to detail the areas? Yes, so the form... there's going to be some flex in the, yeah. in the, in the financial sort of way, so I suppose that the development question is where. So, so the four key areas we, we would need to spend in on. One is risk items, so there would be items we already identified within our 
risk uh, plan coming into fruition. Uh, second is provisional sum, so there's certain areas where we've allocated a provisional sum for a particular uh, specification of work package. If that goes up, that will impact on the contingency. However, there is an allocated amount in the budget. Program delays, so if the program is delayed, we're not anticipating it would or will, but if it does, that will. Um, be taken by contingency. And the fourth thing, but again, we don't anticipate there to be lots of this, is if there's climate changes. If we go back to our contractor and say, actually, we want X different to what we have specified, there will be the cost of that and we'll, that that will come from contingency. But because of the work that we've done today, particularly through a co productive approach with frontline staff and specialists and experts, we're not anticipating that there will be significant changes over the next year that we that we've missed with it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to uh, ask now about consultation in two directions. First of all, the involvement of key stakeholders. And secondly, in the co-production model with the UCM, how did we carry out consultation with practitioners, carers, perhaps anybody else? Um, yeah. So, I would argue that we haven't consulted uh, with um, parents that we've involved in throughout the whole process. So we, right from the start, when we started at the conference, we said to them, we want to, we want to involve you at every stage of this delivery. Um, right from what the designs look like, uh, to uh, what we can achieve, but also some of the difficult decisions. So what we haven't done is just consulted, gone away, done our thing, we've been told them what we've done. We, we've involved them at each stage. Um, in terms of the co-production, having parent care representatives and frontline representatives on a design team working directly with the architects to, to engage directly with them, with them in terms of what they want and what it needs to look like. That's, that's how we've done it. But also, we've gone back with the difficult decisions. So each of these value engineering decisions that have been made has gone back to that design team and said, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. And it's been checked out. I'll give you another example of it, is that what we, um, what we had within the build was some very expensive uh, plastic lining to some of the bathrooms. It's called white rock. And it's very expensive. And we were looking at that going, actually, do we need that? We went back to a parent carer who said, actually, I tried that in my house, it didn't work. I used this paint, which was far better, reinforced paint, and we went to that solution. It was a cheaper solution, but it was guided by parent carers who were saying, actually, this is the better, the better option. But we've gone back with the difficult decisions with our kind of co-produced design team and worked it through with them. What we've also done is made sure that partner agencies have updated throughout the process and we've talked to them at every stage. We've also kept, which hopefully people will, will have seen, on the Your OK website, we've, we've put all the information on the web page so that everyone can see it. We've done monthly updates to parent carers and partner agencies in terms of saying this is what we've done and this is what we plan to do next. And we put all the design information in terms of design and changes on the website so people can have a look at uh, and comment. The board also has partner and stakeholder representation as well. So it's been a pretty continuous start. Yeah, and we'll continue to process so far. Yeah. And I suppose lastly my question is about numbers. Um, what information do we have about future numbers of children and young people needing access to the centre and how future proof is the capacity that's planned? That's an interesting question. We um, have an increasing cohort of children with special educational needs across the city, as do, as do most people. But also, we have um, changing expectations and changing nature of need as we go forward. So we know who the cohort of children that are going to be using this building are for the next few years because they're already children that we're supplying services to. Um, and we know where our growth areas are in terms of the needs of children and young people going forward. But at the same time we are also working with, with parents and carers to think about how we might best give them a bit more control and power about the kinds of services that they might want. So we have very low numbers of parents and carers who are receive the data payments here and personal budgets here. Other areas have, have more than that. Some people may want to take over their own 
manager at their own package of support, in which case they might wish to use a service like this, but also might wish to pay for somebody to come and provide a respite to them within their own homes or out with their own homes. So it's a balance in terms of looking at the amount of provision you need in one entity. What you need is provision that covers a range of spectrum of need. And I'm confident in the work that's been done in the original design phase of this, and also looking at the SND cohort going forward, that this is, this is the right kind of level. We've got some flex in here, so we've got some capacity to trade some of the beds with other authorities if we don't need them all, whilst at the same time we've got the flex that we can, we can use it. And some flexibility within the space as well, haven't we? Fine. Thank you for those, for those answers. As uh, Stuart's already pointed out, this is about the most vulnerable and the most important group of children who need people to care for. So I, I am concerned that we keep a good, a good eye on the management of the project. Um, and so I'm going to make a decision that has two parts to it. The first part is to follow the recommendation in 6A that we agree to increase the budget of £250,000 in order to ensure there's adequate contingency to be funded by environment. Now I'm advised that the uh, delegation of authority to the director has already been incorporated in previous executive papers uh, and that is for a project contractor to carry out that works. Um, so I'm advised that I don't need to make that decision. Um, however, should the legalities not be as I've just described, and they are going to make the decision at 6 b on a contingency basis, and it should be discovered that the paperwork is not going to think of it, then the decision has been has been made. Um, and I would like to be closely involved in progress in this contract and this project. Because I do think it's fundamentally important to not just change what I care with us and to for my service professionals as well. So on that basis, I make the decision. And I close for the time. I don't think there's anything else is now being done. There's no urgency to secure this. Thank you very much.